Leaders from four and or five Gulf states have gathered in New Orleans to culminate the Blue Ribbon Resilient uh, Communities Project. It's the first of its kind project where we've taken the foundation resources and data, gone local, and uh, tried to learn how more resiliency can come to communities that are threatened by sea level rise and increased storm events. We're winding down this uh, lengthy process of building resilient communities along the Gulf Coast, and this is the last of the meetings that has taken place literally uh, from Texas to Florida with a concentration on a, a number of parishes on, along the coast of Louisiana talking about the future and talking about what communities want their communities to look like for future generations in the, in the wake of the tremendous coastal loss that we're experiencing. When you talk about coastal Louisiana, as the slide depicts, you kind of get that sinking feeling. And the unfortunate reality is this is an issue we're going to have to continue to address. But as Charles so eloquently said and said it much better than I, is that there is a silver lining and there is cause for optimism. I'm here to say buck up troopers because we are getting to the point <laughs> we're actually going to make some successes and I would be remiss if I didn't and I know I see Kareem in, in the office and Melanie who on our staff work so hard I know Denise and some of the consultants who worked at putting the master plan together that passed unanimously in both chambers of the legislature not only on the floor but also in committee and it speaks to both the strength of the plan, but as Charles said, it's not perfect, but it's getting us to where we need to be to demonstrate our ability and our plan to restore and protect our coast. And I see my good friend Steve, although he's not with us anymore, his hands are on this, and we miss you, and we appreciate all your efforts as well. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the plan, where we are, and now that the plan is passed, how we're moving forward and what we hope to address. And unfortunately, the reality is, as most of you know, We've lost approximately 1,900 square miles of our coast in Louisiana, and we're continuing to lose our coast since the 1930s. In fact, we've lost the equivalent of 30 Washington, D.C.s, the state of Delaware, Rhode Island, and this is an issue we're going to have to address because, unfortunately, we will lose, within the next 50 years, approximately another 1,700 square miles, something we will not let happen, and we can't let happen, because this is too valuable, not only to the people of Louisiana, not only to the Gulf, but also to the nation. And with that loss, it also presents vulnerabilities that we need to address. We could potentially, within 50 years, get to a point where we're experiencing $23.4 billion in average annual damages to our coast and to the people in the coastal communities of Louisiana. We're currently right at around $3.2 billion per year. But we can't sustain our coast, and the people can't live on the coast, if we get to the point where we're experiencing $23.4 billion annually. As those vulnerabilities exist, also the fact that well, the reality is when a named storm enters the Gulf of Mexico, category two or higher, the highest probability of a storm hitting the coast anywhere in the Gulf is coastal Louisiana. So it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, of when we're going to get hit and how we're going to address that and minimize those issues. And I think Charles mentioned it, and I think in the discussion, references when we talk to people across the nation. Why do you guys want to live there? Why, why, with all these vulnerabilities and issues, you continue to live? And this speaks to that valuable ribbon of real estate, LA-1, which typically can go underwater with a high tide, a southeast wind, but also services one of the most valuable and most productive areas of the nation. You know, Henri would be, uh, he asked that I please mention this. You want to give him a plug. I see Chet right here. I know how critical it is to them and how hard they have fought to put this in place. It still needs to be done, but it's this area, this Fouchon that services 90% of the oil and gas activity in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's critical not only to the Louisiana people, not only to the Gulf, but also to the nation. And that's why we have to live here. That's why the resources, the fisheries, and the valuable assets that we have in, Gulf of Me in the Gulf of Mexico, the people have to be there to provide that to the nation. We've been responding to crises. You know that. We've had Katrina, Rita. We've had hurricanes. We've had the unfortunate oil spill. 
Even since the inception of, of creating the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, I know Sydney and I see John were critical in that effort to getting us to where we are right now in that first master plan. Even since the development of the CPRA, which is relatively as far as agencies go in its infancy, we've had two major events we've had to contend with. While we're developing, again, credit to the staff who put this together, developing that master plan, which is guiding our uh, approach to saving our coast. But despite the problems, we have been making successes. Since the last master plan, we've improved or constructed over 159 miles of levees, created over 20,000 acres of wetlands, have invested over $17 billion in our coast, most of that primarily in and around New Orleans, but over $3 billion related to restoration and projects and protection from state and other federal funds uh, outside of the New Orleans Hurricane Protection System. If you look at some of the projects and concepts we've implemented since the last master plan, I know it's a bit busy and it's hard to see, this represents or depicts the projects that we were engaged in, both protection and restoration across the coast. And people often ask, well, why another plan? Is this just another plan that's going to sit on the shelf? Well, I can assure you this plan, built upon the previous plan, and also identifies priorities and realistic goals in our ability to address and protect our coast. Hey, Reg. Senator Dupre just walked in, if y'all didn't notice. I just would, I'm sure you'd appreciate me mentioning that. <laughs> but the plan is, uh, I'm sorry, Reg, I just had to get you when I can. The plan incorporates a lot of the same principles. You know, we often in public hearings, and again, I think the process and the plan shows that it works. And you'll see in the plan is reflective of what the input and suggestions we got, both from NGOs, the public, and based upon the information we received and generated at these public meetings. But for the most part, the concepts and principles were established and laid out in that 2007 plan. And looking at the projects, there were over 1,500 projects and concepts that were evaluated in the development of this plan. Parish plans, existing plans, QIPRA plans, LACPR, anything and everything that had an opportunity or was considered or looked at had, that had potential to protect our coast was evaluated. And narrowed down to approximately 400 projects that went through the process. And this plan is built on world-class science and engineering. It also incorporates models, existing new models, and improvement of existing models to ensure that we're integrating all the different aspects and we can build on this. And these models will continue, just as the effort to develop this 2012 master plan, the focus group, framework development team, and those opportunities for engagement for the public will continue throughout the process, throughout the year, and not wait until a year or two before we have to start working on the next master plan. And I know Kareem is cringing right now because, in fact, we are actually beginning the process of considering how we're going going to improve and learn, just as we've learned from the 2007 master plan, as we implement projects and start implementing this plan, we will learn things that will improve that 2017 plan as well. And again, as I mentioned, it's grounded in science and the two driving factors are decision, decision factors that were utilized or reducing risk primarily to the coastal communities, but also building land. And also evaluating as we do that, maximizing the ecosystem services, that value that we have on our state and the, the habitat and the resources that we depend on, maximizing and sustaining those, but also addressing the industry and the economy that's so critical and important to this state were factored into the decision process and the priorities. But as I mentioned, we had significant input from the public and the, and the plan reflects that. It's also, as it was mentioned earlier, I think Mr. Garcia was talking about the fact that it's funding. We all know funding is an issue. And the primary limitation of this plan is not so much our ability to protect and improve and restore our coast, but it's how we're going to fund it. It's funding constrained like most other issues and problems we have to contend with. But this reflects the projects within the master plan, the 145 projects that have been identified for implementation that represent the $50 billion 
in construction and improvement and non-structural measures that we will use to restore and protect our coastal communities. This is just uh, looking across the coast. I know it's a bit busy and we can, if you go online, you can look at the plans and get specifics into each project that's being proposed. But in the western portion of the state, addressing those unique issues and problems we have to address, you know, shoreline restoration, looking at marsh creation, also opportunities to protect the communities. In Lake Charles, we have the ability to at some point achieve a 500 year level of protection to the uh, town of Lake Charles and the critical assets in and around that area. Looking at the Central Coast, I know Parish President Clode is here and, and the critical issue and input that they had in, in how we address those issues in St. Mary Parish and Vermilion and looking at the protection we've incorporated but also utilizing the river. Everyone recognizes, just like it was in the 2007 master plan, that unless we connect or utilize the resources and assets that we have, such as the Mississippi River and the Chafalaya River, we will never be able to be successful. And those are key elements in how we're going to restore and protect our coast. And as such, just like the Atchafalaya and the Mississippi River, we're depending upon major diversions. In addition to marsh creation, I know Mar Marnie mentioned the long distance sediment pipeline project. And mining the sediment, that valuable resource in the river, that is going to be critical and essential to restore and protect our coast. So again, I know this is all, just went through different sections of the state. This again shows all the projects within the plan, but if you go to the, um, the website, we're also printing the final copies that will be available to the public. We can, we'll send out as well. You can look at and see each particular plan and project. But what the plan delivers, and as I mentioned previously, the potential is within 50 years, 23.4 billion in average annual damages. With our ability to protect the coastal communities of our state, we will reduce that under the moderate and worst case scenarios, again, just like the core, every other project, we had to evaluate under differing scenarios or potential for subsidence and sea level rise, a moderate and worst case scenario, what the potential coast or protection measures we could provide with this plan. And with this plan, we would reduce from that 23.4 billion down 18 billion to actually around 5.5 billion, or under the moderate scenario, 2.4, which is currently less than we have right now. In addition, and this is the most enlightening aspect in terms of development of the plan, is that we can actually, for the first time since 1930, since we've levied the Mississippi River and completely changed the hydrology in our coast of Louisiana, can say that we're actually going to build more land than we lose. So we can measure our coast and not so many football fields or as we finish this day with uh, presentations and talks and discussion, probably losing anywhere from eight to 10 football fields, we can measure how many football fields we are actually building along our coast in Louisiana and reverse that trend that we're experiencing right now. So the plan provides flood protection to every coastal community in Louisiana. You know, I know we were somewhat hesitant and it's difficult to say, but previously, you know, we talked about restoring the coast, it would take $200 billion. Well, yeah, if we had $200 billion, we probably could do things that ideally we'd love to be able to do, but the reality is we'll never be able to see that. But with the plan, and when we say improves protection to every coastal community, we will achieve that 100 year level of protection, but not necessarily with levies. We will have structural and non-structural methods and opportunities to protect the coastal communities. But also we will have levies and structural measures that will crit protect critical assets along our coast to the cities of Homa, Golden Meadow, New Iberia, Lafitte, and other areas that are important to our coast. And also the plan includes and identifies one of the largest investments in terms of restoring and protecting our coast and utilizing that resource of the river, over 20 billion in creation of wetlands that will protect that valuable resource and habitat. And so by protecting our coast and building that sustainable land and having a plan to do that and demonstrating to the federal government that we do have a plan that we can, provided we have the funding, restore and protect our coast and also protect the sustainability of the ecosystem and that was one of the critical aspects in terms of how we're going to identify which projects and prioritizing those projects. We know we can build projects. Building projects is not the issue. It's we want to build projects that are going to be sustainable and be there for our children and our grandchildren and future generations to ensure that they can enjoy the opportunities that we exist right, that, that we utilize 
and have access to. But one of the interesting things we often heard in, in the plan that it was heavy on diversions and the fact that we're focusing too much on diversions and the potential issues that we would have to contend with with, the, with utilizing diversions. But there's no doubt that diversions are critical and provide a valuable opportunity. But more importantly, they also provide a resource or a way to build land, comparatively speaking to the other measures, from a better cost-benefit ratio. When you look at the amount invested in land building, we're going to put in approximately $20 billion to build and create land in wetlands through marsh creation. And you can see for the dollar invested the amount of land building that will be achieved. But if you look at, and I know it's right, it's, I don't know if we can see it through this, but oh, I just turned everything off. All right, the pointer doesn't work, but if you look at the brown, the sediment diversion, you can see for the approximately the investment of about $4 billion, the amount of land or ability to create and restore and protect land for that investment is much greater than any other tool that we will be using. We also identified the fact that we know with diversions there are going to be issues we will have to contend with. We looked at different scenarios and different different concerns and issues that would probably exist if we have to uh, utilize both maximizing the land building and looking at just no other consideration other than just great large diversions, how much land we could build. And you can see maximizing land building, thank you, maximizing land building has a significant benefit in our ability to build land and it puts us on that inclining trajectory as opposed to that declining trajectory we we're experiencing right now. We also looked at multiple diversions. You know, people often say, well, why these big ones? What if you had a bunch of small of little ones? Well, from the impact perspective, it doesn't matter if you have one large one or several little ones, if you're going to influence or affect an area through smaller ones, it doesn't really matter, but it's the larger diversions that provided that land building benefit. We also looked at no diversions, which ultimately continues on that precipitous drop and a future without action. So there's no question the benefit that will be provided and the effectiveness of the tool of utilizing diversions to protect and restore our coast. In addition, it was referenced earlier is that there is cause, and I know looking at some of the discussion or concern of people that saying they don't have a recognition in the state or other areas of the significance of, our po uh, of the problem we're having in coastal Louisiana. But a recent poll, some of the NGOs, we appreciate their participation in development of this, this poll, indicated that over 86% of Louisiana voters support the action within the master plan, which is very encouraging. And 91% voters statewide approved it, and 98%, which is telling and significant that Louisianans get the issue, for the most part, and are supportive of our efforts to restore and protect our coast. In addition, in looking at the potential for economic opportunities, some recent studies were conducted, and a recent one by LSU looked at, of the 618 million spent in 2010 in coastal restoration had an impact of over 8,900 jobs in our state, and that an investment in coastal Louisiana, which is expected to be around 400 to 750 million, based upon what we're projecting on the $50 billion master plan, would translate to 5,000 to 10,000 jobs, or 270 to 520 million in wages, and between 700 million and 1.3 billion in total sales per year. There was another study by Duke University recognizing an uh, identifying the fact that Louisiana is already a national leader in the creation and protection of coastal jobs. And another study by Restore America's Estuary found that, that if you invest or look at creating jobs for every million invested in coastal restoration, it creates more than 30 jobs per year. It is a seminar that's attempting to tell the story um, to expose the well-kept secret of the invaluable resource that our energy coast is and the wetlands that that serve it and the ability we have to live and to function in that energy coast and at the same time preserve our invaluable wetlands that provide so much in the way of quality of life through the seafood it produces the exposure that we have to the environment, 
the species that make their 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 permanent residence, their permanent homes, their their nesting grounds, their reproductive uh, systems are all dependent on that that wetlands area that also serves as the home base of much of the energy produced to serve the United States. A very conflicted uh, uh, ex a situation on its surface, but it has existed very, very well together. Uh, the, the most known, widely known marriage between energy and, and the seafood industry is the natural habitat that the drilling platforms have produced in the Gulf of Mexico where fishermen and divers go to receive their, their to have their best opportunity at, at um, uh, catching and, and, um, and um, eating, serving uh, the wonderful seafood that the Gulf of Mexico produces. The Gulf of Mexico is the oil and gas energy of America. Um, the Gulf of Mexico has the largest ports in the country, or a majority of the largest ports in the country. Ports move our products. They get things to us efficiently at economical prices. Um, if we don't take care of our wetlands, take care of our retreating barrier islands caused by erosion, we'll have increasingly bad storm damage, which can wreak havoc on our oil and gas, on the products that we expect to be delivered to our towns across the country. We need to be vigilant to uh, get our policymakers to make sure the United States understands what comes from this region. We supply a, a very large bulk of oil and gas uh, in the na nation that fuels the nation. Uh, agriculture moves up and down the Mississippi River, that could be interrupted. Commodities that are shipped through the largest port system in the world feed America and also provide them with goods and services. So it's not a small matter when, uh, you know, 30 percent of the seafood is disrupted that comes from this region. We have to take care of it and it has to be a top American priority.